lecture, now we are into the third part of the course, the culture and communication. Uh, before we can actually start today's lecture, today we're going to talk about intercultural communication. Uh, we will need to do some recap on the concept of culture first. So, first of all, from your point of view, what is culture? Anyone can give me any um, ideas? What is culture? What does culture mean to you? Yes? Uh, heritage, different language, different values, civil communities of people. Okay, so social heritage, value, anything else? Beliefs, for instance? Do you agree that beliefs can be part of culture? Mm -hmm. What else? Okay, so um, before we start for today's topic, one thing we have to all agree on is that in terms of the definition culture, it can actually be very diverse. Do you agree? And there are at least eight different facets of culture. Uh, of, of cultural definitions and then we will just spend some time to quickly review those uh, definitions okay so first of all in terms of the topical definition of culture culture consists of everything on a list of topics or categories such as social organization religions and economies. Do you agree with that? Do you think that we can actually produce a list and then we list everything that we think is culture or is related to culture and then we say that's it, this is the topic list for culture. Any idea? Do, do you agree or disagree with this kind of definition? What would be the disadvantage of this definition? Yeah, we can. It's quite difficult to include everything related to cultures. And then the second definition of culture is historical. According to the historical definition of culture, culture is social heritage or tradition which is passed on to future generation. In other words, we inherited our cultures from our ancestors. Do you agree with it? Probably. And then, according to the normative definition of culture, culture is ideas, values, or rules for living. It sounds a bit similar to behavior, isn't it? And then, there's another definition of culture, according to the functional definition of culture. Culture is the way humans solve problems of adapting to the environment of living together. Meaning that culture must have function, and then it can help us to adapt to the environment, or it can help us to live together without killing each other. Probably it's true as well. And then the mental definition of culture is that culture is a complex of ideas or learned habits. And the most important things about culture is that it distinguishes us from animal. Have you ever heard that animal has culture? I'm not too sure about that, but according to the mental definition of culture, apparently that's what distinguishes us from animal. And last but not least, the structural uh, definition of culture assumes that culture consists of parent and in related ideas, symbols, or behavior. And finally, the symbolic definition.
conception of culture, which stands for a very different point of view compared to other cultural definition. The symbolic definition of culture assumes that culture is based on attributely assigned meanings that are shared by a society. In other words, today, the reason we have certain custom value or attitude is not because we inherit it, it's because of what? Because the meanings of this value, attitude, or even belief is given by the society. And it doesn't matter how many definitions I gave you during our previous lectures or just the brief introduction I gave you, the most important question for you today is what does culture mean to you? There are already eight different definitions of culture. Which one is closer to your own belief? Is culture really a series of value, belief, or attitude? Can we or can we not inherit culture from our ancestor? If, if everything is inherited, how are we going to explain about evolution? How are we going to explain about changes in culture? And then, since this is the third part of our course, there are actually three lectures. Today's lectures will focus on the introduction to intercultural communication. And the other two lectures will be focused on barriers to intercultural communication and how to work with international team and how to develop international communicative competence. And finally, we will conclude these sections with a simulation on international negotiation. And I'm going to show you a very brief video clip. And then we will have uh, some discussions based on the video we just watched. And I hope you enjoy it. The English believe it's slow uh, on your host. It's true, but if you don't play, you'll play. Whereas the Chinese feel you're questioning their generosity if you do. At HSBC, we never underestimate the importance of local knowledge. Which is why we have local banks staffed by local people in more countries than anyone else. Okay, so my first question is, after you arrive in China, have you encountered similar situations? Cultural yes. differences? Or that specific yeah. situation? <laughs> <laughs> it's up to you. Cultural difference? Yes. We had a few of these explained just before we got here, so we were lucky enough to not actually come into contact with that. But that is a major difference for me, actually. Like, mm. Ireland is quite similar to the UK in that way. Mm. And uh, we're supposed to finish our meal or else it's insulting. Whereas here, if you finish your meal, no, they have to keep filling your plate up. <laughs> Doesn't end well. Yeah, how about in Indonesia? Mm. Do you have to finish whatever is on your plate? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then when we watch the video, the other thing you might pick up is that it's food also part of culture. Yes. Yes. So, 
Anyone have any idea what they are eating? Sick? Ill. And also, eels, snakes, octopus, mm. are they common in your diet? In order to process today's lectures, we have to reach um, one fundamental agreement. Is that the fundamental aspect of culture adopt here is that culture is something all human beings learn in one way or another. Can you agree with this sentence? And it's not necessarily inherited, but rather a code of attitudes, norms, and values. In other words, it's, it is a way of thinking or a lifestyle that is shared or learned within a society or a social environment. So this is like a, a little bit of combination of all those eight different uh, definitions of culture. But these statements will find the foundation of what we, what, whatever we are going to discuss uh, in today's lecture. So in today's menu, First of all, we will talk about the difference between cross culture and intercultural communication. It is one of um, the common questions, or when you read a book, some book called cross cultural management, some of, some of books called cross cultural communication, and the course title is actually intercultural comparison and management and then here the main question is what's the difference between cross-cultural and intercultural even before we proceed to the concept of communication apart from they are spelling in a different way any guess cross-cultural are things that we have in common with different cultures mm -hmm. and intercultural it's like communication between two cultures yeah that's definitely correct so you see cross-cultural studies means a comparison and contrast between two cultural groups for instance when a cultural cross-cultural study of Chinese and American focuses on how they host a dinner party, Chinese might focus on cooking and sharing of the food, probably similar to your culture. While American might pay more attention on wine and conversation. I don't know if you agree with me or not. Intercultural studies on the other hand, refer to what happens when people from those two groups come together. Therefore, me as a Chinese, I might complain that my American host did not provide enough food, but I still enjoyed and loved the one in the conversation during the dinner party. But just the food part that I could understand why there was not enough food. So hopefully you can pick up the difference between intercultural and cross-cultural here. However, whether it's a cross-cultural or intercultural communication, as long as we are communicating, there is a model of communication. And it's actually quite interesting to actually introduce the model of communication. For instance, today we are having a conversation. Are we communicating? Mm -hmm. And then how will you describe the process of our communication? Huh? One person speak, the other person listen, yeah. and that's 
the end of the story. Why people actually developed a model of communication. I'm curious about that too. So we will see. So in terms of a model of communication, ooh, it looks quite complicated, but it's actually not. The very first step, in order to have a conversation, both verbal one or non-verbal one, we need at least two persons. One is the message sender, and the other is the message receiver. <laughs> and the sender firstly coded his or her, in my case, her, her message based on my friend of reference. So it, it has a coding process. I have to organize in my head what I'm going to say. Although sometimes what I say may not sound exactly like what I think in my head. So I don't know what's wrong with my friend of reference here. And the receiver, after receiving the message sent in by the sender, for instance, I'm trying my best to make my lecture interesting. But the way I'm coding the message, after you receive it, after you decode it, you probably think, nah, it's boring. And so, the, after receiving the message sent by the sender, the receiver would decode the message based on your own friend of reference. So therefore, The receiver responds on the message. It's really simple. I speak, I speak, you listen, and then you respond, you answer me. So after the receiver responds the message, he or she becomes the sender, and whoever receives this message intent will be the receiver. So once again, it's very clear that when communicating, each sender or receiver is unconsciously or in some cases consciously referring to a friend of reference. So what is included in the friend of reference? For instance, knowledge. It can be both personal or professional knowledge. Experience. It can also be professional, personal experience. And norms and value, it can be only applied to a small group or it can be known and value widely accepted by our society. And then finally, assumption. And sometimes, not only assumptions, but prejudice. So, we know that this friend of reference can be varied from person to person, such as knowledge. Everyone will obtain different level of knowledge. Also, we all have our own personal experience, even if we are from the same country, from the same cultural background. And it can also be varied from culture to culture, such as different social values, beliefs, and ways of living. So in terms of communication, communication theater, we often assume that when the sender and the receiver are from the same or at least similar culture, for instance, Chinese, Indonesian, Russian, and Irish culture, so if you have to group us together, so which group you think I will belong to? I am a Chinese, uh, I was educated in the UK, so exactly based on my knowledge, personal experience, norms and value, and assumption. It's actually your assumption 
will determine that which cultural group I belong to. Right? Are you judging me by my appearance? Or are you judging me uh, by my experience? By my knowledge? It's actually up to you. Which cultural group you actually think I belong to? So in terms of cultural filters, it's actually elements and barriers to intercultural communication. And then the key elements of communication filters, such as language, styles, stereotypes, and relations, are also the main source of intercultural communicative barriers. And we know that in terms of language, there are both verbal and nonverbal communication. Right? Which one you think is more powerful? Verbal or nonverbal? Nonverbal. Nonverbal. So whoever favors nonverbal, please raise your hand. So all of you. Mm -hmm. I remember that um, uh, I think um, yeah. I remember that uh, I was in one of the, my English classes before, and my English teacher said, "You know, eighty percent of human communication is based on body language." And then all of a sudden, I cannot pronounce that word in class, and then my classmates say, in that case, "What I am learning in English at the moment for the rest of the twenty percent." And then even for the rest of the 20%, he complained that we cannot master it. But can we really base our communications on nonverbal or body language alone? Can, even if it, it can come for 80%. Do you think we can? Not effectively. Not effectively. So even for the verbal communication, how effective do you think? It can be if it's for uh, people from different cultural background who speak different language. So in that case, the role of interpreter, translator, will play a mm -hmm. um, will play a very important role in terms of intercultural communication. However, I guess none of you uh, disagree that. Verb, non-verbal communication is really powerful. It's a very powerful tool. So I wonder how many of you have heard the term proximix before? How many of you? Only one? <laughs> Two? Mm -hmm. So what exactly the proximix mean? Personal space. So what is personal space? Okay, so I actually need um, any volunteers to do the demonstration? What's the comfortable space between you and me when I speak to you? <laughs> you <Yeah, laughs> <but it's laughs> comfortable. <laughs> Not comfortable, oh. right? How about this? Yeah. Distant? Better? Better? Good. Here? Okay? Yeah. How about for you guys? Good. Good, Good <laughs> enough. <laughs> Don't get any closer. <laughs> So actually, that's the concept of proxemics. So that's what we know as personal space. So personal space is a sort of personal territory. It is a zone of protection or even of defense. So when an intruder enters this zone, people might feel uncomfortable. And sometimes, not only uncomfortable, it actually also increased your level of anxiety during communication. So sometimes some negotiator actually use it as a tool of negotiation by what? Try to shorten the personal space. But the idea of 
housing mix is not only just about personal space, it also includes the other concept of, of social space. It's the opposite concept of personal space. Okay, so what sense in 1970, which is actually quite long ago, compares the distance between people in conversation in different cultures, and we are still using it nowadays, makes a ranking according to the difference in the size of their personal space. So the violation of someone's personal space can jeopardize the communication due to the increase in anxiety. So, It's definitely not a comfortable personal space for any culture, even if it's in the old country. So, according to the ranking in personal space, we know in our left hand side, we have North Europeans, which <laughs> Are you considered North European? Yes. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> no. <laughs> Sorry. I thought I yeah, I thought Ireland is considered West European. No, no most. Okay. okay, so North Europeans need large personal space. Do you think that's your case? I think it's very individual as well. You can't just rate it by culture. Yeah, exactly. And then you, according to Watson's study, Arabic culture actually requires a small personal space. So, for instance, if you are in a restaurant in one of the North European countries, the tables in the restaurants are placed very close to each other. The occupants might often apologize to each other to the neighbors because they feel that they have violated their neighbors' personal space and the feeling can be neutral, vice versa. Or, if that's the case, they probably won't die there at all. But, do you really think that's the concern in China here? No. <laughs> you guys all died in Tantin before, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so we enter the second uh, concept of today is the role of context. So, in order to illustrate what the context means, here is a scenario. The husband phoned the wife from the office saying, Honey, I'm really sorry. But I don't think I will be able to come home and celebrate your birthday tonight. It's tax season, and I hope you understand. And the wife said, of course, I understand. Huh? <laughs> you see, really okay? <laughs> and, in terms of the style of thinking and communication, the spoken words may not be the primary means of communicating most time. So context is actually the environment in which the communication process takes place. And then we usually divide different cultures into two categories. One is high context culture, means that most of the information is contained in a situation where they are communicating. And the second, second category is the low context culture in which information is explicit in the message itself. In other words, for the low context culture in terms of communication, it's direct, it's assertive, and it's very straightforward. So in terms of successful communication, usually if you have similar understandings of the culture, 
you will have a better chance with the intercultural communication. Okay, so before we finish for today's lectures, I would like to show you a picture. So, any ideas about the picture? South Africa. Hmm? South Africa. Any other guess? Any other country? People might dress and dance dancing like this. You guys are really good. It is South Africa. <laughs> so there's a word called Ubando. How many of you have heard this word before? Ubando? What does it mean? I don't know the meaning, but I heard in the computer. Yeah, it is also a software company. <laughs> Ubando, the term Ubando refers to the spirit of community in Africa, which comes from traditional African culture. It can be translated in several ways, but essentially it means I am because you are. So from your cultural point of view, you think it is a high complex or low complex? way of communication, the meaning of the word. Also, do you have any similar in your own country or language? Any words that similar to Ubando, I am because you are? 